And here I am. And it, I'm just as excited today as if it was the first time I ever preached. It never gets old. Amen. The gospel is good every day. Praise God. I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. And as you turn, I just want to say how much we appreciate our kids being present with us. I want to refocus and reiterate the fact that our reason we do this is not so much that we can speak to them as they can watch their parents worship and see what they do in uh, big church. And so that's the, the point of it is, uh, is that they see you and see your response. There's something healthy and wholesome and lasting when kids see their parents worshiping God. And so it is a great thing. I'm going to ask you to stand with me one more time. And I'm going to begin reading at verse number 5. And uh, I, will, uh, I don't know how I'm going to do this because I've got uh, a lot of stuff. But I'm going to try to be as brief as I can this morning because I, don't want, I want to have some response time at the end. Notice what Peter says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective. And the word in the King James there is barren, barren, or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, can I say there, the Bible indicates that you can have knowledge of the Lord and it be unfruitful. In other words, you don't follow through. And that's not what we're about. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, bless the reading of your word. We love you and praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I believe the theme verse, and maybe the theme verse maybe would apply to both First and Second Peter, is found in the third chapter in the 18th verse, near the end of the second epistle, where Peter says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. And I I, I was thinking, we have grow classes on Wednesday night, and it could be just another uh, thing on the schedule, or it can be a very important time. And I, I feel it's very important. In fact, I know Chris and I were having a conversation, and he was working on his doctorate, and I think he was using, he was kind of, I don't want to say psychoanalyzing me, but he was analyzing me spiritually. And that was okay. And, and when in the conversation he said to me, is growth a key phrase to you, a value that you hold. And I said, why, certainly, growth. I believe Christians should grow until they breathe their last breath. Amen? Oh, I was so weak. If you're no stronger than that, you won't make it. I believe in it, and it is a value. It's one of the values that I hold very dearly. And I want you to know this morning that what this Scripture holds is critical, it's crucial truth that applies to every believer, to the pastors and to the parishioners, everyone. 
is, is spoken to in this passage. Barren and unfruitful believers are in for a rude awakening when they stand before God. And what I want to do is not have that happen. We don't want to be there empty-handed. We want to have fruit to lay at the Master's feet and say, this is what we've accomplished with what you've given to us. And so it's incredible. It's, in, it's, in, it's very important to us. If we are barren, remember in the Old Testament, barren, barren meant sterile, not capable of conceiving. Here it refers to idle. That's the, what the word means, idle. These are idle believers. It's descriptive of a field that has been plowed or planted, but it's producing nothing because it lies idle. It's not prepared. It's not been tilled. And it's fallow ground, as the Bible refers to it. Hard ground upon which the seed falls, but it doesn't take root and it doesn't begin to grow. It's not ready to receive the seed of God's Word. And of course, the question for every one of us this morning is, are we ready? Are we ready to receive what God will say to us in this hour? Plenty of opportunities already. From the song that we sang together, there's power in the blood. All the way to recognizing our guests. There are many things that have already been said that could very easily speak to the hearts and lives of people if we are ready to receive. And the question is, is our heart prepared to receive what God would say? Because we can be barren. That means no spiritual children, no fruit. Or we can be fruitful and have many spiritual children. And I want to share just a real brief clip from the blessed life that we are studying on, on uh, Wednesday night. Robert Morris is the speaker. And he tells one way that we can lay up fruit or treasures in heaven. Those of you that have been in that Wednesday night uh, teaching, what is treasure? What are true riches? You remember what he said? That's right. I heard a solitary voice over here. And you're right on. People. If a man wins a whole world and loses his soul, what will he give in exchange? In other words, you're not going to win the whole world. But if you could, it wouldn't be a good deal. Listen to this. It's very short. In other words, there are going to be people in heaven that welcome me, that say, I'm here because you gave. I know that a missionary came and brought the gospel to us, but I found out, because when heaven see, we're going to know things. I found out there were 47 people that supported that missionary, and you're one of the 47, and if you hadn't supported that missionary, I wouldn't be in the kingdom today. That, that's what he's talking about. See, God is the only one who can take unrighteous mammon and turn it into souls. True riches. That's what true riches are. Amen. All right. That's just a little brief clip. We, we have been blessed. And uh, he, I, I love what he said in the first, first segment. It's not a blessed pocketbook. It's a blessed life we're talking about. How do you have a blessed life? Can I just give you something that uh, before I get to it, actually? Abundant life here. Abundant entrance there. I want to say it again. Abundant life here. Abundant entrance into heaven. And if you're living a pauper's, spiritually pauper's life, don't expect a grand entrance into the kingdom. Because God doesn't make his Truth and his riches just available to rich people or to poor people. They're available to people, amen? And we can be spiritually impoverished. 
famished and not really feeding on the things of God. Don't expect a great entrance into that kingdom. And you'll see that at the end of this uh, teaching. So we can, have, we can be fruitful through giving to missions and helping others. That's a great way. But we can also experience the personal joy of being instrumental in leading someone to the Lord. One little story that I never forget is the pastor. The lady called him and said, Pastor, could you come over here quickly? I'm talking to a friend, and she's ready to accept Christ as Savior. And I want you to come over and lead her to the Lord. He grabbed his coat, put it on, was going out the door. And God spoke to him and said, don't go. What do you mean? How would you like it if you were fishing and you hooked a fish and someone came over and took the rod and reel out of your hand and said, let me reel it in for you? You call the lady back and tell her, God is using you. And he wants you to know the joy of leading this dear friend into a relationship with him. The joy of soul winning, the joy of, of being fruitful and your life making a difference in the lives of other people. That's joy. That's real joy. Hosea said to Israel, backslidden Israel, sow to yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord till he come. And rain righteousness upon you. Hosea 10, 12. Jeremiah said the same thing, basically. Thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground, unplowed ground in the NIV. Do not sow among thorns. Mark 4.19 teaches us in the parable of the sower and the seed that the thorns are the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the other things, desire for other things. Did you know I've come to this conclusion? One of the great problems in the world today is a problem of lust. It's manifested in many ways. It can be lust that leads a person into pornography or to being unfaithful to their mate. Or it could be the desire for riches, could be what you lust after. You want it with whatever it costs you. And the Bible says, Isaiah said, don't sow your seed in the middle of that. Because it'll grow up and choke out the word and become unfruitful. I'm convinced that the greatest hindrance to a person following God 100% is making a living. Is taking care of our family. Is doing what it takes to pay the bills, keep the lights on, food on the table. And if we aren't careful... We can be caught away with this and lose sight of him. And God is saying to us, that will not work in this life. You will not be a fruitful Christian if that's how you live. And so we want to be careful and make sure that our hearts are tender and soft and prepared for the receiving of God's word. And this is not my message, but how do you do that? Repent. Repent. Change your mind about sin and about whatever stands between you and God and begin to seek after God with all of your heart. That's how you break up the fallow ground. I could go on a lot about that, but I'm not going to do that today because that's not what I want to talk about. The Bible teaches us we are to continually grow in the Lord. It's a proven fact that we're either growing in the Lord or we are backsliding in the Lord. We never stand still. I read this story. Its title was, Don't Float, Swim Hard. And it was a story of uh, 
some folks who were out on the coast of Florida, about four miles out, and fishing, and the wife decided to take a swim, and so she dove into the water, unknowing that the currents were very strong. Pretty soon she was moving away from the boat, could not come back. And she cried out for help, and the husband dove in as well. Now they're both in the water. And he's a, a champion swimmer. And for six hours, he is fighting the current. They made, this, they made a decision because they were drifting away, the boats further and further away. And they made a decision. He would keep the boat in sight and swim against the current. And when he got back to the boat, he would pick her up. And six hours he did that. And finally the tide began to come in. And soon he was at the boat, climbed into the boat. But it was dark. And he couldn't find her. And the next morning, he had, he had uh, gotten on his radio and called for help. And the search crews were out and they discovered her 20 miles away, still alive. And she was saved. And that teaches us that in the current of this world that's going in the opposite direction that, that God wants us to go in, you can't stay still. When you stand still, you're backing up and don't even realize it. You're either going forward or going backward. The question is, which is it? Are you going forward? Are you going backwards? Are you backing off? Can I ask you, let's just get real personal. Are you closer to God today than you were yesterday? Unless you've been swimming hard against the currents of this world, you've backed up from even yesterday. You're looking at me funny. It's true. You cannot stand still in the Christian life. And what he is talking about here is our efforts have to go in a certain direction. And he enumerates those things that we are to be adding to our faith. And when he talks about this, there are two, two areas that I want to talk about. Because you cannot drift into God. You don't get closer to God drifting. You cannot drift into fruitfulness. It's intentional. We make a decision. I'm not going to be barren. I'm not going to be fruitless. My life is going to change. I'm going to be different with God's help. And we began to move forward. If you read verse, the, the early verses of this chapter, you would read that Peter says his divine power, verse 3, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's an, can you believe that statement? Well, you must believe it. God has given us everything that we need when we come to him as our Lord and Savior. To live, a, live the life. Did you know only God can give life? That's a God activity. I can't produce it. You can't produce it. God does. And godliness is likewise. Only God can produce it in us. And he wants to do that. But we need to wrap our mind and our heart around the truth that Peter gives to us. It will change this church. It will change every person in this church who will get their arms around this truth that God has already provided everything we need to live this life and to be a godly person. Faith is the means. And in verse number one, Peter says, you in the King James, it says, like precious faith, right? King James... We've obtained like precious faith as the disciples. I like the way it's written in the ESV, because, and I like both of them. I like the floweredness of the King James, but I also like this part of it. 
because uh, He has given to us those things and we have moved into it. He says here that, uh, that God has opened the door for us and given us the same level of faith that the disciples have. In other words, my faith is no different than Peter's faith. And we can know that because of what the Scripture says. Like precious, a faith of equal standing with ours, Peter said. I love Peter. I can identify with Peter. Have you ever stuck your foot in your mouth? I've done that several times. The only way you haven't is if you don't talk. The Bible says that if you don't offend with your tongue, you're perfect. You're mature. But we're all becoming. And so we have the same level of faith. Equal faith. Equal standing with ours. A faith of equal standing. God hasn't given disciples a level here and a level here for us. But we have equal standing in our faith. Like precious. Faith of the same value. Faith of equal standing. But notice how Peter introduces himself. Peter, a servant of the Lord. And, 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 and an apostle. Notice the order in which he gives it. A servant and apostle. He starts number one with servant. And number two with apostle. Now there's a vast difference between a servant and an apostle, isn't there? An apostle is one who has authority. He's one who has authority to speak for Jesus Christ. And God has given to him that authority. And so the servant, it means slave. It's a bond slave. A bond slave in that culture could actually be killed by his master and there would be no questions asked. He had no will in the matter. Peter said, I'm a servant of the Lord. I have no will in this matter because I've laid it aside and his will has become my will. But I also have an authority that God has delegated to me, but I'm not lording it over God's people. I'm not a generalissimo, someone that stands and barks out commands, Peter is saying. If you go to chapter 5 in his first epistle, Peter says, unto the elders, I am also an elder. And he puts himself on the same level as those he communicates with. That's an art of communication that only God can give us the ability to do. Where people don't believe and see us as standing on a pedestal, pointing the way, but we're down where they are. We are shoulder to shoulder, eyeball to eyeball, sharing truth that has made an impact in our life. And that's what the world needs. People that aren't, don't, don't let it go to their head because they have spiritual gifts. I, was, I couldn't help but think about the scripture. I think Peter penned these words, and so did James. But I, I know James did. He said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. And I know that's in that, con one of the contexts of that in James is after he has said, uh, turn your joy into mourning and abandon your sin. And he's telling them to get things right. Humble yourself unto God. And that's one of the ways. But I'll tell you another way to humble yourself. It's when God endows you with a gift or gifts. You don't go around dangling your gifts as if you want everybody to know you have them, but you humble yourself unto God. And you stay humble before God. Remember what Jesus said when he sent out the 72, I believe, or the 12? And they came back and rejoiced and said, even demons are subject to us. What did he say? 
Don't rejoice because demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And every one of us, that should be the number one reason for rejoicing. He saved me. He has brought me out of darkness. My life has been changed. But that's not the end of a journey. Peter goes on to say, in essence, that even though faith is a gift from God, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Our faith even comes from God. It can be developed, and we can grow stronger as we feed ourselves from God's Word. The same humble emphasis is continued though, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing. And what he is saying to us is this. Our faith comes from God. We didn't work it up. I can't give you faith this morning. I can give you words from this book that if you hear them and receive them, faith comes by hearing. Amen? Amen. But faith comes from God. God has dealt to every one of us faith. And it's not inferior faith. It's God's faith. And we, we have to be very careful that we don't become haughty and high-minded as Pentecostals even. And we have to realize that what we have come from God. It's not by chance, but by God's choice. It's not our efforts, it's God's efforts. I read this week that he was talking about aliens, and, and in, I believe it's in one of these books, he addresses himself to the aliens. And the author said, we're not aliens because the world rejects us. We're aliens because God chose us. And I said, yes. I'm an alien. This world isn't my home. I don't feel at home here. Why? God has chosen. Who are the chosen, the elect? Those who respond to the gospel message. They are the chosen. And so I've responded. And I'm part of that family. And I have a family feeling. I can say out of the warmth of my heart to him, Father... Dad, you are my Father. You are my God. We're not strangers. Now, I don't get familiar with God. He's still God. And God is exalted above all of us. But thank God I can get closer to Him. And so the Bible talks about the, these things. And in our, in our text from chapter 5 to uh, verse 11, chapter 1, verse 5 through 11, God has given us so many great resources. Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith. Make, take, make all diligence. The word means every. What is it talking about? Maximum effort on our part. And I said, God is part over here. He endows to us certain things. And there are other things that I could mention if time permitted. But here's man's part. My part is to give every effort, the maximum effort, to make sure these things become part of my life. It, it can be zealous. I, can, I must be very zealous. It means haste. It means earnestness. Show the same diligence. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 10 through 12. In verse 11 and 12, the writer says, show the same diligence to the very end. And that's what I want to say to you this morning. We, we don't just say this, we do it. Till the end of this journey, we give ourselves diligently to God. He says, do this in order to make your hopes sure. 
We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. You know, can you imagine standing before God and saying, well, I just couldn't make it today. You mean you can't get your El Dorado camel out of the garage? To come to our heated church and sit on our padded seats? How's that going to fly? Oh, God understands. I'm here to tell you, He does not. He will not receive that. He will not be second place. God will be first or not at all. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. And this morning we're saying, make Him Lord of all. Because you and I can't handle this anyway. And so he's talking about growing in our faith. And true Christians do not stop pursuing growth in grace. You know how we tell a true Christian today, did you pray this prayer? And that's not correct. That's not even biblical. Prayer doesn't save you. Jesus does. In fact, we we sang about this in in one of the courses today about God's power. And he says, God's divine power hath made available to us these things. You see, I can't break loose of this world's hole in my own strength. It took the power of God to do it. It took experiencing God's power, not just believing about it, but experiencing God. Now, many of you, you're climbing the ladder where you work, and I'm all for that. I think we ought to be the best employees. Bring honor to God. But if you're giving more effort to rise up in your job than you are in your spiritual life, you better take an assessment because you're going to leave the job here and you're going up there and you're going to have to give an account to God for how you've lived in this life. Are you here? You're thinking, I know deep deep water runs smooth and quiet. Here's the deal. They're not satisfied with their present attainments. Do we have faith? Yes, we do. But they apply all their strength and being to increase in these areas. The literal translation says, furnish in your faith virtue. What is virtue? Moral excellence. And we begin to to, uh, straighten our life up. Get things right. Well, if God's not pleased with this, he'll take it from me. Not as long as you're holding on with a death-like grip. The moment you release it, God will take it. But you and I have a part to play in this. And so we're to apply ourselves diligently to advance in moral excellence. That means we don't watch things. We don't go places that bring temptation in our life. Even if the Bible doesn't mention it, we lay it aside because it's not good for us spiritually. And we do what is best for our relationship with God. But don't be satisfied with that. The Bible says, he says, in your faith, you produce moral excellence. Now, increase your knowledge of God. That's not knowing more about God. That means get closer to God. Know God more intimately. Romans chapter 12, verses, uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for you, for them, is that they may be saved, for I bear them witness. Listen to this, this verse. Verse 2. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. God wants us to have a relationship with Him. He wants us to know him personally, being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. I read a story. It really captivated me. I was was on the internet and I ran into this article about uh, this girl back in the 17th, 18th, 16th century, 17 years of age 
who had come to faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And the church sent to her one of their leaders to convince her that she was off track. And they tried to convince her that by good works and other means, you get into heaven. And when he saw that it wasn't going to work, he told her, said, you know, there's no hope for you. And she said, only, I will only see you again if you change your attitude about God's Word and about Jesus Christ. They cut her head off for that, for her faith in Christ. They blindfolded her, led her out to the gallows to, uh, to, to drop the deal on her neck. She voluntarily laid down. She couldn't see, but she felt her way. Laid her head in the stocks. And they dropped it and took her head off. Her last hours were spent determining what her final words would be. How that she would honor Christ in those last moments. There are mega churches. I read about them on online AOL this morning. And I'm not negative about them. I, I love them. Bigger, better for me. I love the more people, the more I like it. But I'm going to tell you, I have to ask myself the question, what is the caliber of converts that we are producing today? How do they stack up against our forefathers? Will that generation rise up in the judgment and condemn us because of our loose living and our casualness about God and about His Word and about what His commands say? Increase in the knowledge of God. It says, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And that's a no-no. No is will. No is will. So much of our praying today is for our needs and our wants. And I believe that God meets those needs. I do. I can testify God meets our needs. But our prayers should be more filled with what is God's purpose at this moment. What is God's will for this church at this hour? What about my life? What is God's purpose? What is he saying to me right now? Do I hear God? Do I know what God is saying? The Bible says, to your knowledge, add self-control. In verse 4, the latter part of that verse, it says corruption comes through lust. And in the King James, there's a, a footnote about that word corruption. It means it's got the word depravity. How, do, how does a person get into a depraved state, to a diseased mind, where they cannot make a proper decision now between right and wrong? It's lust is the doorway. It destroys. It tears down every barrier in our life against sin. And God is saying self-control, anger, anger, other things. It's good for us to, to get control. And somebody said, well, you know, the Bible talks about gluttons. I want to mention it one time. That's the only time I know in the Bible. The Bible says if you're a glutton, you should put a knife to your throat. If you are, please don't practice that. Just quit eating so much. Amen? There's a whole lot of difference between gluttony and adulterous living and lasciviousness and being drunk on the things of the world. Master your passions. Don't be satisfied with that. Increase your patience. Patience is not a good word in the church. People don't want to hear it. 
Because the only way to develop patience is through trials. And we're not praying for any trials today. We're praying to escape the trials. But actually, God allows things to come into our life to teach us patience. And it's so important to us. Then grow in godliness. What does it mean to be godly? It means to be devout. To be devoted to God. And what Peter is saying is let your devotion and love for God grow. Let it grow. Let it grow in your life. Don't be satisfied with what you had when you first came, but do I love him more today than I've ever loved him in my life? That's the question. Do I love God? Add to your self-control godliness. God's looking for devoted people. And then grow in brotherly kindness. Oh, brother, we talk about getting to heaven, how great it's going to be. But if we can't get along on earth, Jesus said that you might be one. And we want to be everything that God wants us to be. Brotherly kindness. Make every effort to see that your affection for other believers grow stronger and stronger. And I could, I don't divulge things that are are confidential, but I could give you some very up-to-date testimonies. But I would, I'm afraid I'd violate a uh, a confidentiality, and I don't want to do that. But, my, when I see people and I rub shoulders with people, some that are very quiet, that never will be on the, in the forefront. But when I see what they do and how they contribute to the work of God, my heart just swells. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God for our people. Thank God for our brothers and sisters and their love for God. And then he, that's brotherly kindness. And then the last one is love. Love everybody. Love souls. Have you ever wept over Greenville? Have you ever cried tears over Greenville? Have you, ever, have you been this week brokenhearted one time for the hundreds, maybe thousands of language group and people groups in the world that have never heard the gospel. What about those who have heard? Like us, we've got it. We hear it every week in multiple ways. But our hearts growing in love for those who are outside the ark of safety. Whenever He says, as a believer continues to grow in the Lord, you embrace these seven, what I would say, seven critical aspects of our faith are developed as we grow in the Lord. What happens when a person does not press forward in Christ? They become spiritually blind. Did you know that word? If you do a little research there, I won't get into it. Deeply, but it means to close your eyes to things. We close our eyes. At best, we understand it to mean I cannot see anything past this life. Here's a reason why I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Because I live in a fleshly body that is filled with desires that do not please God. And every time I present myself to God, that's what I'm presenting. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that gives me standing. And one day, this body, this flesh, that has caused us so much difficulty, will be no more. And we will stand before God in a spiritual body And we'll be able to worship Him 
without all the stuff worrying about what my neighbor's going to think about me. Oh, they may think I've lost my salvation if I move forward and answer an altar call. Not going to do it. When we get beyond all that stuff, and I'm, I said it this morning, Lord, I want one day to stand before you and your work is finished. I'm now home with you and be able to worship you in that pure atmosphere that we will enjoy when we get to that city. You see, people aren't talking about heaven today. They want heaven down here. They want to live as long as they can, and that's natural. But don't be fooled, and don't let this stuff blind you. He's blind to the future, spiritual things. And blind to the past, he's forgot what God has done for him. They're powerless. They have no spiritual power. And I read this from a Baptist pastor. Their danger is not being saved at all. Now we believe that if you walk away from God far enough, you can step over the line and lose what God has done for you. And I do believe that. But even if you don't, if that's not your persuasion today, if these things are not in you and abounding, you will not have an abundant entrance into heaven. You may not make it at all. Are you really saved? Paul said, examine yourself to see if you are in the way, in this way of Christ. Where do you stand this morning? When you continue to press forward, you confirm your faith is genuine. Again, I say, we look at people, did you pray this prayer? Well, I prayed that prayer, good. Have you shown the fruits of it? I look for fruit. I believe God looks for fruit. And I'm not the judge, and I'm tr I try not to be. Secondly, you will never fail. You will never fall. You see, you cannot go backwards while you're going forward at the same time. You will have rich, abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These seven qualities don't earn us that. They are evidence that we're headed in that direction. And those evidences should be in our lives. We know Him better today than we've ever known Him. We are morally excellent. We, have, we, we know him better. We love him more. We're available to serve him. Which area do you need to work on? I have a lot of them I am working on. That's why I don't make many boasts about my spiritual life. Because I believe I've, I am not finished yet. I want more. Has God done some things in our lives? Yes. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm not satisfied. I am satisfied, but with a dissatisfied satisfaction. I want more. I want to know you better. I want to experience your presence. Are you certain that you're saved? How is your heart? Is it hard or ready to receive God's Word. When we get ready, the seed will come. Get ready. Christ is prepared to speak to our heart. The Olympian runner from Tanzania, I believe, had an accident while he was running the race and Everybody, all the winners had been recognized and were gone. Only a few people left in the stands when the horns began to blow and people began to cheer and in limped this man from Tanzania. And he finished the race and they went around the area. He did a victory lap to celebrate completing the race. And someone asked him at the end and said, why didn't you quit? You knew you didn't have a chance to win. He said, my country didn't send me 7,000 miles to begin a race. 
He's, they sent me to finish a race. And this morning, I'm telling you, God hasn't sent you to start a race. He sent you to finish a race. To be a good finisher. I'm going to read a book. I haven't read it yet, but Richard Dunn told me about it. It's written by a man who made a study of the Bible figures. And here was his conclusion. About 20% of people who have done great things for God finish well. About 20% in the Bible. I want to be a good finisher. Do you? I want to run this race with every fiber of my being until the trumpet sounds. Until God says, you're finished. You're, you've run a good race. you fought a good fight. you finished the course. There's laid up for you a crown. Would you stand with me this morning? Thank God. Thank God. This is probably one of the most important messages <clears throat> I will ever preach here. It's something to chew on. Something to get a handle on. Something to hold on to. You want to see the church transformed? This will transform the church. Because it will change us. As we engage in this journey, we're not just walking when we could be running. We're waiting on God for added strength to run and not be weary, to walk and not faint, to soar with the angels. I want you to bow your heads with me. If you're not ready to meet the Lord, I believe in the imminent return of Christ Jesus. I believe he could come back today. I do. I believe that. I'm looking for him. If not today, surely tomorrow. Would you go? You see, there'll be no time when Christ comes. Suddenly, as a thief in the night, the Son of Man cometh. This morning is your time. It's your invitation from God. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready if you're not. Get your heart ready if it's not. You can't put your life on hold until you do anything. I determined that when I started out on this segment of my journey about 50 years ago now. I'd made that determination. I will not put God on the sideline for any reason. But I'm going to seek God first. It's one of my scriptures. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. He's met every need. He meets every need. He'll meet your need today. He'll forgive you. If you've strayed away from God, your heart is cold toward God, you need to get the fire rekindled this morning. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do want to pray for you. If you will slip your hand up and down, and guys help me in the balcony, I can't <clears throat> see good up there. <clears throat> the lights are a little bit in my eyes but on the main floor I'm looking here pastor I'm not ready to meet God today I'm not sure about that but I want to be and I want you to include me in this prayer would you just slip your hand up can I pray for you God bless you thank you just put it up and down anyone else I'm not sure about my soul you say, well, I'm a good person. Well, I wished it was goodness, but it isn't. And how would you ever know you're good enough? It's through Jesus and Jesus alone. That's how you come into the kingdom of God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? I want no one looking around now, please, except for myself. I'm going to start over here. Pastor, there's some of the areas you touched on this morning that I really need to work on. I just want to be included in this prayer. I am determined in my heart to work in these areas, to give my full diligence to making progress here. Just slip your hand up and down on this side. Yes, God bless you. Yes, there's some things I need to do. I get the chance to repent before I talk to you. Just slip it up and down over here. 
Pastor, yes, 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 I will. I've, I, there's some areas, yes, yes. I want you to know that we want to do everything that we can to aid and help and encourage and teach that will help people who really want to go all out for God. I'm going to pray for you, along with the person who raised their hand for salvation. I saw one hand, but there may have been others. As I pray, listen, prayer doesn't save you, but turning your heart towards God does. And right where you're standing, what I'm going to invite you to do is to turn your heart Godward right now. Lord, I know I've sinned against you. I know that I need forgiveness. And today I'm sorry. I want you to forgive me for my sin. Those of you that are coming back to Christ or you want to be saved. Right now, Lord, I come to you and I, I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for taking my life to live in me and through me from this day forward. You're going to have all of me there is to have. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Lord, I pray for my friends. I know this is not a shouting message, but listen, the shout will come if we take to heart what Peter has given to us. Let us not be content with what we've received, what we've accomplished, what we've seen done, but give us a holy discontentment that will drive us to our knees to set aside choice time in our schedules where we get on our face before God and seek Him. Seek Him, not something from Him, but seek Him for our lives. I pray for every person, Lord, that these qualities would not only be in them, they would abound. That mercy and, and truth, grace and truth, would be multiplied in their life, I pray. <clears throat> in Jesus' name. Fill us up to overflowing. Help us to live an abundant life. And I'm not meaning riches, full of God, running over with the goodness of God. I bless you, I praise you. Right now, to seal Holy Spirit in this room before we walk out of here into a world that's lost its way. I pray that you would put your seal of approval on the Word of God. Seal it in our hearts this morning that the enemy will not be able to come and steal it away. I ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, will you lift your voice for just a moment in adoration to Him. Just bless Him in your way, whether it's a clap or whatever. Just let God know, yes, 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 God. I will because you will enable me as I make this commitment.